On today's show, we'll discuss every major league team's bullpen situation with guest Greg Jewett of Reliever Recon and The Athletic. Ah, fantasy baseball advice of who and how you should choose your closers for your upcoming fantasy drafts. My voice is a little hoarse for this episode, but hopefully the advice and information is still sound. So stay tuned. Beat the Shift is next. And welcome to another episode of the Beat the Shift podcast. I am your slightly hoarse-voiced host, Ariel Cohen, and with me, as always, is Ruben Guy. How are you, Ruben? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? Uh, okay, other than I'm a little bit hoarse. I guess uh, I was on a plane down to uh, First Pitch, Florida, where uh, we had the First Pitch Conference and we had the uh, mixed labor auction. So uh, I guess I guess I got a little bit of uh, a little sore throat or so, but I'm feeling pretty good. How are you, Ruben? I'm doing well. I thought you were maybe cheering on the World Baseball Classic because that's in full swing and that's actually fun to watch. Oh, yeah, that's right. Tonight uh, we had uh, Team Israel, who I am rooting for, uh, along with Team USA, of course, but uh, rooting for Team Israel. And uh, the kid who started today, Jacob Steinmetz, uh, actually a uh, local kid here, actually went to the same high school that my uh, my wife graduated from. Uh, I... I, I uh, I play with uh, my center fielder on my softball team. Was He was the assistant coach of his high school baseball team. So we're very familiar with this guy, uh, and uh, pretty cool to see him. Uh, he had a 1-2-3 inning, and uh, Team Israel's now up 9 nothing in the ninth inning on the Washington Nationals. That's pretty cool. That's cool, and he is a prospect right now in the Arizona Diamondback system. That's right. All right, well, let's go get right to the show. Uh, we've got a great guest today. We're going to be doing our relief pitcher preview episode. I won't talk that much since I'm a little bit hoarse, but this guy will. Uh, you know him from The Athletic and from many other places. Greg Jewett, reliever recon. Welcome. How you doing, Greg? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, gentlemen. All right, and uh, by the way, thanks for beating me in Tout Wars in the playoffs this year. You uh, You knocked me out, so thanks. Yeah, you and Clay Link, I just couldn't take down Frank. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, but you had, you had an amazing run. I mean, that that week you had against me, I had my best week of the entire season, and you just completely clocked that. So uh, kudos to you, and uh, and thanks for coming on the show anyways. Of course. No. I've gotten to know you well through the last couple of years, so it'll be it'll be fun to actually do the uh, our auction in person this year for Tout. Yes, looking forward to uh, to seeing you uh, and doing this live. We've been doing Tout Wars on the, uh, online for the last couple of years, but uh, great to be back. All right, so let's get right to it. Closers. All right, pretty, pretty different than it has been in the past. I mean, I remember a couple of years ago, you know, you get your closers, and there's plenty to go around, and roles are stable, and, you know, if it's not one guy, it's the next guy if he gets hurt, and so on and so forth. But we have a lot of different situations. We've got closer by committees. We've got... Two closers on a team. We've got some teams with lockdown closers. There's some teams that we don't even know who the closer is. Coach won't mention it. Even some teams like the Diamondbacks, there are four different guys. We have no idea how they're going to operate. So what, let, let's just start very generally, Greg. You know, what, what is your general take on the closer stra- – the closer let, – let's talk closer landscape in baseball first. Well, as you were intimating, you know, last year actually 222 re- – Pitchers recorded a save. However, uh, the number of pitchers getting 5, 10, 20 actually went down. Uh, the number of relievers getting 30 saves actually stayed stable, but the other numbers, so there's there's a lot of uh, dispersal uh, of these save situations with more and more teams uh, moving towards a high leverage matchup situation where uh, roles aren't necessarily defined by inning. It's more by the pocket of the lineup, and that's what's creating a lot of the um, frustration and confusion for the fantasy community because we're kind of still latching on to the term closer even though the uh, that actual position is, is kind of uh, waning at the – you know, as you look around these teams, I mean, even the Mets were saying after Edwin Diaz signed his contract that part of the allure was the fact that he was willing to pitch the eighth inning against Atlanta in a couple of very important games because the best part of their lineup was coming up in the eighth. 
So they wanted him facing those guys rather than saving him for the ninth inning. And, and we see this more and more. I mean, the teams like Cleveland, where it's just, you know, it's Emmanuel Clause in the ninth inning are becoming uh, the the rarity, not the norm. Yeah. Anything to add, Ruve? No, nothing has really changed that much from prior years, except, you know, last year they we had the whole lockout, and, and when drafting closers, everyone wanted to get a secure closer. And two years ago, uh, coming off of COVID, no one really knew exactly what was going on and, and, and how everyone was going to bounce back. So there's more stability overall in general in baseball, which means there's more stability there in, in, in the closer role as well, just because – uh, going into drafting um, season, we have a better idea of who has a job and who doesn't have a job. Yeah, it's hard to compare to what was going on last year in draft because we had the lockout and we just didn't know where people were signing. We didn't know roles. Um, you know, several closers didn't even have a job, right? So you know, it's hard to it's hard to assess where to pick them. So because of that, the closers were pushed up because of the certainty of whoever did have a job on, on a team. Um, so before we talk about the actual teams and strategy, the question to you, Greg, though, is if you had your choice of how to have the strategy last year, what would have been your optimal strategy? Meaning, you know, if, you know, going into knowing what you know, how, how the closers shook out last year and how save was distributed, would you have said, get the one lockdown closer and that would have been the strategy? Just take darts like what what would have been the optimal strategy in high insight? Uh, when you look at how the teams in the top 25 did, uh, of the top 25 teams in the main event, the the most um, popular closer on those teams was Kenley Jansen. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily that you had to shop at the top end of the closer tier. It was more that uh, you just had to have your, what we, we talked about last year is having an anchor and you intimated it. It, when you guys were both speaking a moment ago, so an anchor is a guy you think that is pretty secure in the in in the save in the primary save share, where this guy is going to get me thirty saves. I mean that's that's what we're trying to hope for when we take that first one. Then after that, you can kind of adjust your draft strategy. So the optimal plan would have been uh, letting somebody else take the Hater Hendricks picks and. Getting in there after because Rizel Iglesias was actually going third last year in ADP. So after I after Rizel went, getting your first um, closer would have made sense as an optimal strategy. And then um, we recommended Daniel Bard um, during spring training about halfway. You know it was very condensed, but um, as it looked like he was going to get that role, um, that was a that was definitely something we put out on Recon. Uh, and, and a lot of our subscribers were able to get Daniel Bard. So if you got your anchor, then you drafted Daniel Bard late. Uh, and another guy that we were hyping up last year very, um, very early was Ryan Helsley. You pick him up on the waiver wire, then you had your, you know, two or three closers a week right there. That To me, that would have been the optimal. Get your anchor, get somebody late that you think has a pathway to those saves, and then make a good early in-season addition and then you can kind of coast as opposed to chasing the you know chasing the saves all year in the fob hey would you consider josh Hader to be a success last year like if you picked josh Hader where he went was that was that a success do you think well from a safe standpoint yes i mean he had he had a rough month and he went through personal issues and that's not something for me to speak about um you know there's there was stuff going on with his son being traded. I mean, you you can take it. Now, I had three shares of Josh Hader last year in my teams. Two teams came in second and one team came in first. Uh, so it wasn't like having Hader on my roster was, um, you know, going to put me at the bottom of the league. It, it just meant that I had to do a little more work. But, of course, as as we know that I, you know, with that being my niche, it's kind of, you know, anticipated that I can handle those rough waters. And would you say that Rysel Iglesias was a success last year? Because he was, you know, fantastic for the first half a year, and then he didn't save a game for like a month on the Angels, and then he got traded and no saves after that. Would you say yeah. that that was a successful pick? Yes and no. I mean, it's you can't put that one in black and white because he got traded. It's not his fault he was no longer the closer. Um, and actually he pitched very well for Atlanta, but then he was in the eighth inning. Now, the nice thing about Atlanta is, is that they're with Brian Snicker at the helm is they're very traditional. So 
they kind of like their seventh, eighth, ninth with set rolls. Uh, so that that kind of insulates Iglesias this year. So from a from a safe standpoint, it probably was not a success, but from a strategical one, it was. And I know I know what you're leading in with that. <laughs> what the lead in over there? You want to talk about Bednar? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, let's do it now. Uh, let, let's ask Move in first. Uh, yeah, but I'm hinting there that you know if you if you have a closer that saves half a year and he gets traded, question was that a successful pick? And of course, you know if you think that Bednar is going to get traded on the Pirates this year. Uh, is that a good pick, even if he is completely fine for the first half of the year? What do you think, Ruben? I think it is a good pick. There's nothing wrong with getting those saves. Those saves are still banked. What about mm-hmm. the year when Shane Green was traded? And he had all those saves in the beginning of the year for Detroit, and he was traded to Atlanta. He had a, a bunch of saves, and it's not like when you get traded away, you lose those saves. You're banking those saves. And a lot of times, people you can get you can get closers on the waiver wire all throughout the season. And if you can supplement that closer who's going to get traded then it's it is considered a success and i don't think bednar is going to get traded either he's still un- unless unless he get unless they get a boatload of stuff from him because he's still under team contract until 20 or team control until 2027 so the pirates still have a lot of control with him left i, I don't see a reason unless they get blown out of the water that he's going to get traded there are other situations that may be concerned about uh closers being traded but as for bednar i don't think that there's too much concern there do you agree greg yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, last year uh, the GM was on record saying that they learned their lesson from selling low on Clay Holmes. Not that trading Bednar would be selling low. Um, however, from the from the team controls aspect, and not to mention that he's a local guy. I mean, he's very popular. I mean, trading one of your most popular assets in the middle of the season during what you're trying to tell people is a rebuild. Uh, would not be a very good look. I mean, with all those years of control, and I, I would be willing to bet he would take a team-friendly contract buying out those arbitration in a year or two after. I mean, this is where the Pirates have to start being forward-thinking instead of getting into the trenches like they are with Brian Reynolds. You say, hey, you love it here. We love having you here. So we're going to give you this five-year deal for this amount of money. And I think Bednar would would sign it tomorrow. Very interesting. I, I, I've had the opposite take on him that, not that you shouldn't roster him, but that I, I would just ding him a little bit for the possibility of being traded. Uh, certainly in a shallow league, there's no concern because waves are more uh, easily available. But if you're in a deep league, a mono league or a deep mixed league, uh, not that you shouldn't get him, but you know, I ding him a couple of dollars uh, because of the fear of it's only half season worth of of uh, saves. And then, you know, you're not going to be rostering the guy. Uh, I mean, I guess you could as a middle reliever, but uh, you, you would only want him really as, as a closer. But you also don't know what situation, we'd also don't know what situation he's being traded into. He's going to be in a Russell Iglesias situation where he's going to pitch the eighth inning, or he's going to a team in the playoff hunt that needs a closer because their closer went down because of injury. So, you know, just because they get traded doesn't necessarily mean they're going to lose their jobs. Yep, that's also true. Of course, the probability is not certain that if he's traded there, but it, it's all it's all a probability, right? It's all a there's some percentage chance that he won't be a closer. And there's also injury. Yeah, there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, all right, so Greg, you you said that last year's optimal strategy would have been to get your anchor and then to get some guys late. Does that apply this year? Is that really the way to go, in your opinion, for 2023 closers? Um. Again, everyone has to play to their strength, but I am still an advocate of it. Again, I don't think you have to necessarily get Edwin Diaz or Emmanuel Clause. Um, and now this year, it's Hader is usually the third reliever, at least in NFBC drafts, not necessarily uh, in, in the other public leagues. But um, once Hader goes, you'll see a little bit of like a, a nine or 10 pick lull, and then there's going to be a closer run. So. Hopefully you're in the middle of the draft. So when that closer run happens, uh, in my most recent draft, I was not. I was picking at the wheel, and I thought about taking a closer at the one point, and I didn't. And then I just watched the queue disappear. Uh, so if if you now again, I'm not scared to roster saves in season. So it's not like if I don't get one, my my build is going to collapse. Uh, but if you don't like doing that or saves is your weakest point then yes make it a make it a point of emphasis that at this point I, I want to try and you know identify the person at the 
bottom of that you're comfortable having and then if that run happens you might just have to reach a little bit but at least you know you're getting somebody that you're comfortable with uh, as your anchor and then you can then you're not forced to overpay as the draft continues um, there's there's waves in those clusters where there's a rush of closers and then there's a lull and, and you'll start seeing that lull again around pick 150 to 200 I think only two closers were going in OCs uh, last month. So, I mean, it's just a matter of what you want to do and how you approach it. But when you get into that range, you're talking about the guys that are sharing saves, not necessarily people that are going to be getting them for, you know, 75% of the time on their team. Do you think it's prohibitive to roster a closer in the second, third, fourth round? And, you know, I say this because, Closers don't usually return their value or anywhere near it. They're only going expensive because of the safety of having t- uh, a player that is more likely to. Here's it's it's my job. I, I'm getting the saves. Whereas a lot of teams, you have closer committee, so it's the safety. That's why they're going earlier, I would presume, or the more certainty, I would say. But do you think it's cost prohibitive? Because you know, in the second round, you're you're skipping out on some major people. You're skipping out on, you know, a Rafael Devers or third round. You're skipping out on a Sandy Alcantara or, or you know, it's just you're, you're passing up on so many really good players who are going to earn closer to their true value. Do you think it's prohibitive to buy a closer that early? It's not prohibitive, but at the same token, if you do do that, then you really need to wait because now you've got to – amass those innings and plate appearances that you're sacrificing uh, in the, in those rounds that you're speaking of in the second, third, or fourth. Um, so again, and, and the template last year was, again, we, we were talking about how, you know, Clase was going after the guys at the top, you know, Jansen, and, and in, that, in that realm. So, I mean, guys that were going in the sixth and seventh were still giving you 30 saves. They don't necessarily have to strike out um, potential that some of those guys at the top have. However, um, you can still get those in a round or two later, especially if you're, if you're trying to get that really foundation to your build and then you're going to start branching out to the other things. Do you agree, Ruvain? I mean, uh, you've been a proponent on this podcast of not doing that. Um, and I, I just took uh, I, I took uh, Edwin Diaz in the third round of TGFBI. So for some reason, I... I didn't think I would actually do that, but uh, but I did. It just you know viewing the options and and when I wanted to get certain players, it just was the right build for me at that time. What do you mm-hmm. think? Did, are, are you uh, are you against that? I am against it. I, I don't want to leave so much value on the table. I want to get my base for my whole team. Getting a closer doesn't get you a base for a whole for a whole team. If you get an offensive player, you're going to get a base for four, maybe five categories. And I think to, when you're when you're making your when you're building your team, you're not going to get that same type of value later on. You can get a closer later on in the same TGFBI. I waited until I think it was the fifth round or at the end of the fourth round, beginning of the fifth round, to get a, a, a Ryan Helsley because I don't want to overpay for that. And I was a proponent last year for it. And if you if you want to play in the top tier of closers, that's fine. But I prefer to play in the bottom part of the top tier that's out of the f- first three or four rounds so that you're able to get the value that you need to and still be able to get the closer that you want. Now, at the same point, I think that it is important to have one of those top guys just because you need to have that anchor and you don't want to overpay for that anchor. And I think going the first couple of rounds is overpaying and I just, I, I just can't stomach a guy. I'd rather have three or four darts at the end and hope that they hit because there are so many closers by committee that there's a good chance that it's a coin flip before a lot of these people that flares that you think they're going to actually close. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think Edwin Diaz, though, is a little bit of a unicorn because of all the strikeouts. You're getting essentially like a fourth starter almost in terms of strikeouts uh, over there. But yeah, I agree. And I also think that, to me, it's easier in an auction to get one of these top closers because you can then distribute the money differently. In a draft, it's either or. You're either taking, you know, class A or a, a prospective third round. You can't get both. So I think it's more prohibitive in a draft. In an auction, I'm more inclined to take a top closer. Um, Want to ask you though, um, Greg? Darts at the bottom. You know, you have a lot of guesses. Um, either one of the Arizona guys, or even like the Dodger guys. You know, Dodgers are a good team, and you know, maybe maybe they split this. Maybe they split everything. Maybe maybe they, you know, they end up with one person as the closer. But either way, Dodgers guys are cheap, and they're you know they're they're going late. They're cheap, and you know, could be a lot of save potential there. 
Well, what's your take on darts this year? And if you are going to throw a cheap dart, what is the best way to throw it? On a better team or on a guy who's more likely to be the guy on a team? Um, I think the team concept is important, not just from a you know projected win standpoint. From also, you're including the manager's tendencies. You know, Dave Roberts has said he's not scared to play the matchup game. Um, but a lot of the the quotes that you're reading, either from Roberts or from the general manager, uh, and, and you know, as this is as this is evolving, is it sounds like they're going to try you know Hudson a lot of times in the ninth inning early, but when Alex Reyes is ready to return, if they can improve his command, then he's going to be a part of that as well. Uh, I I just want to tell people to be. Temper their expectations a little bit. I mean, you know, Evan Phillips had an unbelievable year last year, but he's very valuable in what I label as the highest leverage reliever, which means, you know, he, Andres Munoz, and other relievers, when it's the best part of the lineup, they're the guys that are in there, whether it's the seventh, the eighth, or the ninth inning. They're not they're not married or tethered to one inning. It's they're they're lined up to match up with the best part of the other teams batting order in those biggest situations to help the team win. Um, they're more there for the win probability added than they are to get a save. And you just have to bake that into your expectations. So if you're taking Evan Phillips based on his low whip last year of 0.76 and his new arsenal in, you know, providing more strikeouts, if you're drafting I'm thinking you're going to get 15 to 20 saves, then, then you're going to be disappointed, possibly. Now, I'm not saying he can't achieve that. I'm just saying that the way the team is built, that they're going to keep him in the what they'll call, uh, you know, like I said, the HLR or a fireman role where he's going to go in where it's the best situation. Uh, so, so you're baking all of that into a, a little pot. So, like, you know, the Cubs last year said they were going to do that, but then when David Robertson was there, he was kind of the primary guy, unless he needed the day off, then other people would fill in. Um, so, past. Past usage patterns usually gives you a little predictor of the future. So the, the hard part is right now is we got new managers in a bunch of spots. So we just don't know how they're, they can say one thing and do another in the season, which people have taught us. So we don't know how Griffel's going to handle the bullpen in, in Chicago for the White Sox with Hendricks out. We don't necessarily know how... Quartaro is going to use the bullpen in Kansas City. He came from Tampa Bay, so is he going to go to the more matchup mode? And will that hurt Scott Barlow? So there's a lot of ancillary factors that that go into these things. So if you're shooting darts in those team, take one, and then if your dart is not the guy, you can you can switch them in a in a in a league where there's free agency acquisition. You know, it's it's tougher to do that in a draft and hold because you don't want to throw four darts at the Arizona bullpen and it's option five, then you're then you're left holding the bag. Is it worthwhile is it worthwhile to do a handcuff situation for a lot of these situations, or is it just better to get one dart on one team and another dart on another team? It, it's really gonna depend on how many spots are on your bench. Like if you have if your league has IL spots, then you can take a chance with the Dodgers. You can you can get Hudson and Reyes and put them on the IL when the season starts, and then as they come back, you see how they're used. And then if they're being, you know, if Hudson's being used early on for safe situations, you can get them in there. Um, you know, all of the 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 lead concept makes a big difference. Like in a draft and hold, I don't want to be taking three to four guys from one team because I'm chewing up a lot of bench space just for one shot at a closer if that makes sense i I don't want to i don't want to be throwing darts all over the place you know if i'm going to shoot a dart in arizona i'll pick one guy and then if i hit it that's great and if not i'm not tying up bench space with that person um again it's a lot easier in leagues with you know waivers or free agent acquisition than it is in the draft and hold formats so and i don't think that's where a majority of people play um, so again, you, you can be smart and you can try and get the handcuff and that's okay. But just remember like the, the red situation in 2020, somebody would get a save. Everyone added them on Sunday and then on Monday, somebody else got the save. So you're, you were always chasing last week and not, not the saves that are coming down the road But you know, you don't want to get into a situation where you're playing close or whack-a-mole and you're always on the wrong one. Well, what do you think of some of the, uh, um, 
the unsure, the unsettled bullpens, let's say in Seattle, for example, we have Munoz and Seawald. The problem I see with rostering some of those guys, or even both, if you want to play this handcuff deal, is that they're very expensive. Like, if, if you're going to guess wrong, you're shelling out a high cost. Whereas if you pick, you know, Evan Phillips and you're wrong, uh, or Hudson, you're wrong, you know, you're, it's a low pick. Um, any thoughts on those? How about, like, the Twins, Johan Duran, um, Jorge Lopez? You know, if Duran is just the high-leverage reliever and only gets a third of the sh- uh, share of saves, when well, you're spending a very large amount of money on him, um, is it worth rostering both guys on those types of teams? Is it too high a cost to get both? What are your thoughts on some of those uh, uh, expensive ones? I think it's build dependent. So like if I get um, Jordan Romano as my as my anchor, he's not a high strikeout guy. So I might want a Munoz or Duran as a, we'll, we'll put it in quotation marks, as a half closer. So I'm hoping they'll give me 10 to 13 saves, but they're also going to rack up strikeouts, <clears throat> which will help me out with Romano. And then at the end, I can get a couple of darts. So then I'm, I'm not doing the big spec game with all of the other things. Uh, it's, but on the flip side, if I have Felix Bautista and I'm a little nervous, maybe he'll miss the first week or two of the season, then I might wait a little bit and get Jorge Lopez where he's going in the twin situation just because he's the least expensive as far as draft capital of the teams you're mentioning. And he still might get 15 to 18 saves just because we know the Twins depress uh, arbitration salaries. And so Duran's young. I think he'll just be entering his arbitration window. Uh, So they're not going to give him a a busload of saves unless they have to because they don't want to pay him. That's just been their modus operandi through the years. Um, So weigh all of those things. The build really matters how you're adding that second and third reliever option. It's not just I'm getting this, that, and the other. It's because I got A, and now I'm looking at B, if that makes sense. I gotcha. And what do you think about um, you know, a strategy where you would say, you know, just get one closer and save a lot of fab capital for closers? So, you know, I'm going to budget $400 out of 1000 on on closers i'll cheap out in the auction i'll get one right but the other one i won't spend any high pick on is that an effective use of capital like you know spending 400 or or you tell me what is a good amount that that you can allocate and reasonably uh, be assured to get you know some kind of good share of saves on the waiver wire well if you're going to do that you just got to try and make sure you're you're adding the guy the week before he gets that first save so like those who added Helsley before he got his first save um, were able to get him in a much more palatable um, fab bid than the, than after. Once those saves happens, then you're paying, uh, we, we joke about it like in the NFBC, that's the, the Sunday save tax. A guy gets a save on Sunday and all of a sudden on Sunday night, everyone has to up their bids for that reliever uh, percentage because that happened. Uh, it's hard to say that because it's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say... Four hundred dollars of my thousand in fab for closers, and then one of my top starters gets hurt. You know, one of my best starting pitchers. Now I got to overspend to make sure I get the best option on the wire, or when this hot prospect comes up, or Andrew Painter comes back and his elbow's okay in in June. I'm gonna, I'm, I want to get him on my roster because I need to fill that other thing. You know, I don't want to say I'm gonna spend this amount on chasing saves because other fires might happen, and then you're scrambling. Gotcha. All right, before we go on, it's time for the Injury Gurus Trivia of the Week. Well, now we're going to start talking a little bit more about middle relievers, and is it worthwhile drafting middle relievers? So I was looking up some stats from last year. So this, I'm going to give two multiple-choice questions. Question number one, how many relief pitchers last year had between 5 and 10 saves. Last year, how many relief pitchers had between 5 and 10 saves? Was it 21, 31, 41, or 51 players? Are you saying only 5 to 10? Only five, between 5 and 10 saves. I'll guess 41. Uh, I, I would go with the 30 to 31. Ding, ding, ding. 31, pl- for 31 relievers had between 5 and 10 saves last year. And how many relief pitchers with 50-plus appearances had 7 or more wins? Was it 10, 15, 20, or 25? 
I mean, Helsley was the unicorn on that one. I, I'm going with the low number on that one. I'll, I'll pick the second lowest. <laughs> second lowest was 15, and that's correct. There were seven. <laughs> there were 15 relief pitchers that had seven or more wins. So. Is it worthwhile to draft these middle relievers if you know you could vulture a save or two and vulture a bunch of wins, especially in today's day and age when starting pitchers don't go that far? It can be. And, you know, if, we, if we're trying to, like, just, you know, conceptualize how we're going to handle saves and relievers and whatever, um, in a 12-team in league, if you're thinking about maybe, let's just put a, a random, let's just put like a, a decent number out there. So 70 saves, that's usually going to keep you really competitive in your league. You don't necessarily, you know, you don't have to win your league in saves with like 96 or some ridiculous number. Uh, the, top, the top teams in the OCs last year did not do that sort of a thing. 70 keeps you very competitive, so that gives you the availability so if i have a very good anchor and he's giving me my 30 and then i'm doing other stuff in the year i can have an andres munoz available so if he's scooping up vulture wins because the mariners are tied in the eighth inning and he starts racking them up then he becomes very valuable uh, i you know we're not too far removed from how people were paying a pretty good draft capital for chad green not too long ago before his injury there's no reason michael king can't replicate what he did in that season so you know, the, the, these are the little things, and especially in deeper formats or, or, or mono leagues that become very important because I'd rather have Michael King going in a week than some guy getting a two-step that gets blown up and kills my ratios. So you have a very, you have a very um, good point there, and, and it's just a matter of making sure that you don't ignore saves, but having – that's why guys like Munoz and Duran are valuable even at their price points because – they can give you wins, they can give you saves, and they're giving you strikeouts, and they're protecting your ratios. So they're still they're still viable from a fantasy standpoint. Yeah, so I, I think that for guys who have the potential to get a save, a, a save share, like let's say Bruce Dark Gratterall, um, sure. I mean, that's definitely worth a, a low dart. But I think the question, or I'll answer the question as if Ruvain's asking, is it worth rostering middle relievers who you don't expect to get saves? Um, the answer is it's worth rostering, but I think the answer is it is not worthwhile to pay a draft capital. Like paying five dollars at the auction for Chad Green the other year was not worth it. I think that you're better off waiting, seeing who the reliever is in the first two weeks that makes a lot of sense, who's got that high K minus B B in the first two weeks, uh, and grabbing those guys and playing those guys instead of a uh, seventh eighth starter. Um, on weeks where you sort of need it, where the matchups aren't great for your pitching staff. I think playing the middle reliever is a great idea, but I would not spend any draft capital on it. Your last reserve pick, second to last reserve pick, sure, uh, but I, I wouldn't waste a lot of time. And, and, and you know what? Uh, middle relievers are not fantastically sticky year to year. I think that you very often can see in season who the guys are good in season. It doesn't exactly translate year to year, and so I wouldn't pay any kind of price for that at all. So, so would you rather draft an Adam Wainwright in, let's say, round 27 to 30, or would you rather pick a middle reliever that you know is a consistent, like, let's say, uh, I don't know, I'll throw out an Aaron Bummer, who's, who's, who has had a couple of seasons, or a Josh Stamout, who has proven before that he can strike out a lot of people. Would you rather have him, or do you rather pick an Adam Wainwright? Well, I don't particularly like Adam Wainwright for this year, but in terms of that kind of concept, I would rather choose the Wainwright, because the middle relievers should be... Cheap, free on the waiver wire any week in a you know in a mixed league even even in a fifteen team mixed league if you're in a uh, if you're in a mono league that's something different then I would go for the reliever uh, but the uh, but in a mixed league no I would I just take the free commodity uh, and if the starter is somewhat usable um, you know you can use them even every other week at the very bottom on your bench for a start I think that's a much better play. Let's do. Uh, let's go around the league and talk about some uh, closer situations, some bullpens, and get Greg and and Ruvain's take on you know what you would do with that situation, who's the guy, so on and so forth. So I'm just going to read a couple of names out. Let's start with the stable situations. You tell me, guys, if 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 you tell me if if you think that yes, it's one guy only. Yes, totally pay the draft price because he they're they're gonna get those saves almost assuredly unless injured. All right, Felix Batista, agree? Yes, I love the mountain. Yes, 
Yeah. Yes, but early in the season, he may start off a little slow because he does have some knee soreness and shoulder soreness. So just there's something to watch early in the season, but yes. Yeah, they're, they're saying he's targeting uh, mid-March to to start ramping up activity. So uh, he, he has been throwing, yes, but I, yeah. I, I love him. Just make sure you, you plan on you might miss a week or two at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I, I think we're fine with that kind of thing. And he has a walk-up song. Oh, the, the whistle is awesome, yes. Yeah, guys who have walk-up songs, that's, that's the guy. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> but, they're, you know. but they're cracking down on this. Remember, they have certain time period to get warm-ups, which is why Buck Schalter said they want to keep the music going and then stick Edwin Diaz in a cart and have him you know, get the bullpen cart there because they're not going to have time for, the work, for, the, for those songs. It's, they're cutting out the times, remember. Yeah, if you think that Major League Baseball is going to make a better product by kicking out Narco and, and the, the trumpet, Timmy Trumpet with Diaz, and that's going to make a better product? No way. I mean, that there's no way baseball is going to do that. That that would be very, very, very uh, bad. Then that will people, fans, and everybody will jump all over that really quickly. So I, I don't think that's going to happen. All right, back to the guys. Clay Holmes is he the guy? He's the guy. However, the Yankees, like the Mets, have said so. If if Bo Bichette and Vlad Guerrero Jr. are going to bat in the eighth inning, you're probably going to see Clay Holmes because he's very good against right-handed batters, and that's going to be the point where they need him the most. So he's the primary save share. However, I don't think he will get every save exclusively, if that makes sense. Are we talking yes. like greater than 80% for Holmes specifically? Yes. yes. With health, yes. Okay. Just, okay. just you know, you just have to understand that, you know, that will happen at times. Kenley Jansen. Um, he's good as long as he's healthy, but I, I, you can, I'm sure Ruvain will back me up on this. You should just plan on at least one stint on the IL. Yes, uh, he because he's getting up there in age. You you can't bank on a full healthy season from him. Jordan Romano of Toronto. Yes, Romano's their guy. Okay, Class A. Yes, agreed. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's. Yes. I mean, he's 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 the guy almost more than anybody as far as exclusivity. And uh, Roth, uh, um, Ryan Presley of Houston. Same as Jansen. He's their guy. Just bake in at least one stint on the IL. Yeah. And Rafael Montero is the guy. Like, if you're in a, a deep league, I really like Montero. He got a lot of saves last year. I think he got, like, 14 saves almost. 13, yeah. 13, okay. I was close. Yep. Uh, Jose LeClerc. I mean, he's going later in draft, but to me, I think he's easily the guy. What do you think? I'm not sold he's the guy just because they brought in Will Smith. I, I don't think we can overlook Will Smith's attachment with Bruce Bochy. It's not that Will Smith is a great reliever, but he's only one season removed from over 30 saves with Atlanta. Uh, I just think I'm, I'm nervous about LeClerc just being viewed as the guy. He should open the year as the guy, but I think if he goes through any sort of command troubles or a couple of blown saves in a row, that I think Bochy will quickly move to somebody else I, I i i'm nervous about how that'll play out and and the last and the last time will smith was on a bruce bushy team he was the closer there so mm-hmm. that's something and also jose leclerc is in a contract year that he's this is his last year of his contract there's a good chance that the rangers are out of it he may be a guy that's traded all right so i think that's a situation maybe to watch and put your thumb on the pick up will smith button uh be ready to press that i guess uh rice Iglesias now he really didn't get any saves in Atlanta, but we presume he's the guy. Is that so? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not absolutely. That, like I said, that's one of the most stable bullpen situations with Brian Snicker at the helm. As long as Iglesias is healthy, he's the guy. I mean, he could easily get 35 saves this year. Remember, Iglesias was being taken third among relievers last year. Right. In right, the preseason. Right. So, I mean, it's not like he became a bad pitcher. And he actually used his changeup more, which increased his strikeout rate uh, when he joined Atlanta. So that's something to keep an eye on. All right, what about Kyle Finnegan of Washington? I don't really see too many. I mean, Hunter Harvey, nah. Finnegan, is he the guy? Um, he'll be the guy at the open of the season, but I, I, I'd be shocked if Washington doesn't trade him at some point. Okay, is that a, a situation to buy or stay away? Or what do you think? Stay away. Stay, stay away. away. Okay. Yeah, I just don't see a lot of saves accumulating there. I, I, I'd rather let somebody else take them. I'll, I'll take somebody else later. Okay, let's go to Edwin Diaz, and that's a slam dunk, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, he's the guy. Just like we said, there'll be a couple of times if they're fighting with Atlanta, they'll use him in the eighth inning. Don't panic. What about Williams in Milwaukee, Devin Williams? He's the guy. Um, I'm just curious because he's never been the guy. He's always been Robin to haters Batman. I'm just curious how he will handle that situation. He's always been a very good, we've always said if he's a reliever or a closer, he'll be a top five guy. Well, now we're going to find out because I've, I've seen more than one person put that on Twitter or in articles. So we'll, we'll, we'll just see. Right. Again, I, I think he's the guy. We're just, we're just waiting to see how he does under the spotlight. Same stadium. He's not changing teams or situations, and nope. uh, he's a lot of strikeouts with Bednar uh, with uh, Williams. So uh, mm -hmm. you know, should be good either way. Uh, David Bednar, we talked a little bit about. I presume he's the guy. My worry is that he's going to be traded. But um, Greg, you say that he's a fine pick, right? I, I'm I'm very very okay with where he is. Okay, uh, Ryan Helsley. Now Helsley to me is not the guy. To me, he's like a seventy percent save share. You got Gallegos getting a bunch. Is that how you see it? In the second half last year, Gallegos uh, had uh, over 80% games finished rate. Uh, he kind of took that over from Gallegos. Uh, I, I'm not too worried. I don't know how Ruvain feels, but I think Helsley's the guy there. Yeah, I, I think Helsley is the guy there. Um, I think he'll get close to 80%, but on my TGFBI team, I drafted both of them because Gallegos is a valuable reliever. Mm -hmm. Oh, Absolutely. And that's not a bad handcuff because that's just cheap at the very end. You know, mm -hmm. what the heck? You know, if you if, if you if you see that Helsley's getting all the saves and you drop Gallegos, and no problem. Uh, Daniel Bard. Um, now, I, I know I've heard you uh, talk that you don't believe in him this year, but he seems to be the guy after doing it two years ago. Why would they say, you know what, we'll go to somebody else to start? Oh, I'm not saying Colorado's going to name somebody else a closer. I'm saying... Um, you know, Rick Wolf and uh, Glenn Colton have made a career of not paying for a career year. Um, and, and that's what you're doing if you take Bard at his price point right now. I, I just, I don't see the, the ERA or the whip staying at the same point. And, you know, there was an interview and, and he's 30, he's going to be 38 this year. And he said with the pitch clock, it's like a cardio workout. And he's pitching in cores half his games, I, I, you know. If, if he's feeling winded in spring from the pitch clock, what's he going to be feeling like in cores? And he's in the WBC now, so he's not going to be pitching for the next week or so with the pitch clock. So I, I'm just nervous of him not being able to um, hit his projections, if that makes sense. Totally. Now, listen, he's a, a crappier closer, to put a, you know, to use a very <laughs> rudimentary word. Uh, not a low-value closer, but he's the guy for now. Um, all right. What about Josh Hader? Any reason to suspect he's not? I mean, they traded for him. Yeah, no, I'm not worried about him. You know, I, I, you can't quantify what it's like when you're pitching for a contract, but he's a free agent at the end of the season. And like Edwin Diaz last year, I think he'll be um, very motivated to put forth his best effort and have a great year so he gets a, a nice paycheck at the end of the season. Camilo Duvall in San Francisco. Um, I liked him adding the sinker in the second half. It really helped him out. I think he needs to use his cutter less. Um, and they added Taylor Rogers, which helps because if there's a heavy left-handed pocket of the lineup in the ninth inning, Taylor Rogers can pitch to it instead of Camilo Duvall. So that should help him. Um, I don't mind Duvall. Just, I would just say plan on like 25 to 27 saves like last year, not, not him graduating to the 30-plus role. That's fair. They got both Rodgers. They got both the Twins on the same team. Is that amazing? Yeah, they, they, and if they pitch in the same game, they can both, both get hold, which is interesting. Yes, very, very cool. Uh, here, talk about brothers. What about uh, Alexis Diaz? Uh, is he the guy? Cincinnati's been doing a little bit of committee last couple of years, but he actually stood out last year pretty well, and the name is a pedigree already. What do you think? Yeah, uh, C. Trent Rosencrantz kind of put uh, David Bell's feet to the fire, and Bell said, yes, he's our closer with shades of gray saying that, you know, if we need him sometimes in the eighth inning, he'll be there. But, you know, if you take him just, you know, Cincinnati's not going to be very good this year. But if you get 20 saves from him, then I, I think you're getting exactly what you signed up for. Sure. And the price is commiserate. Would you rather have the Colorado closer or the Cincinnati Reds closer? Uh, I'd rather go with the youth. I'll take the Reds closer in this situation. Two bad teams. I'll take the better strikeouts from Diaz. 
I, I agree. All right, let's talk about a couple of situations that are more split and could be more costly. Uh, Tampa Bay. This always is interesting because Tampa Bay is known to have like around 28 different, even though the roster is only 26, <laughs> they have 28 people getting saves. I don't know how that happens. Uh, no, I'm kidding. But they have like 13 or 14, literally 13 or 14 guys. Even in the 2020 season, there were 60 games in the year, and they had 13 different people closing games. That's just that's hard to do. Uh, but they gave some money to Peter Fairbanks. Mm-hmm. I like Jason Adam. I think he's really outstanding. Um, is it worth rostering multiple people? Is Fairbanks worth the cost, even though he might get 60% of the saves? I mean, I don't think you can ever get a Tampa guy get more than about 60% of the saves. Like, the, it, it may be less than that, but I think that's like a cap. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on Tampa? Um, I do like Pete Fairbanks, and I do like the fact that they gave him the contract because he doesn't have to worry about arbitration, keeping him from safe situations. And I do like your point about Jason Adam, like where he's going in in current um, ADP is kind of criminal because he can still get you 10 saves. He's going to pick you up vulture wins, and he's going to protect your ratios and give you strikeouts. So he's like that guy you're almost talking about, you know, past round 20 where he's worth targeting because, and if you pair him with Fairbanks, it's not bad because again, you're getting very good ratios and you're not having to worry about if something happens to Fairbanks because he does have a pretty checkered uh, injury past, uh, but he, he really changed his arsenal with the Rays and it unlocked the door to a new level of production. But um, I'm okay with either one of these guys personally. Ruvain, do you agree on the cost of Fairbanks? With uh, I'm just worried that there's a cap. Well, his cost is really – it's escalating fast. Like in, in my TGFBI, I, I he went I he went in the ninth round. Yeah. So and anyone thinking they're getting him at pick 200, those days are over. That's, that's a little too high, but if you want to go for the same type of handcuff, these two guys together, I mean, their their ratios are, are, are very good. I mean, if, if you want a good middle reliever who may get who may vulture some saves and may save for like three straight weeks and then be taken off closer job because that's what the Rays do, then – Adam is the great is great for this, and and he's right now he's still relatively cheap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I just bought him in in labor uh, on on Sunday in the auction. My very last pick, one dollar, Jason Adam. Why not? I mean, uh, I I already had saves in the team, but I don't know. Great ratios, ten more saves. I I'll take him for a dollar. You know. Mm-hmm. Um. All right. What about the Duran Lopez situation? I find myself trying to buy Duran because the market premium that I see for for saves. Uh, and I think that Duran has a chance to getting more than half the save. I, I don't think Lopez is really that good. Like, even though I know I know that you might say, well, you know, they want to milk the arbitration system, so they want to give more save to Lopez. But Lopez really isn't all that good. Uh, and, and at some point, they got to trust Duran and, and just say, all right, just, just go with the ninth. So whether it happens early on, whether it happens half the way in the season, um, barring injury, I think Duran's going to get a very large percentage of the save share. And if you look at what his value is, it's so much higher than what he's going for in terms of in the draft. So I, I kind of like that situation. And and if you want to take Lopez as the handcuff, Lopez is almost free uh, in in uh, mixed league. So to me, that's a great situation. What do you think? I mean, it's pretty easy to identify Duran's the best arm in that bullpen. We just don't know how he's going to be deployed in season. I mean, so so if Lopez flames out, what if they keep Duran as the HLR and just elevate Griffin Jackson to the ninth inning? I mean, there's no telling what Baldelli is going to do. That's the only downside to any of this. There, there's no downside in Duran and his stuff. Um, and he did have a, a pretty long injury history in the minors. So, again, he's, he came out flaming at 101 miles an hour where all of the veterans are kind of taking it easy and ramping up. You know, you're, you're seeing all the veterans coming in at two, two and a half miles per hour below what they started out with last year, but they have, they have a full four-week period to ramp up their velocity. Again, I, I love Duran. I was on him, I believe, last year ahead of many people. I hyped him up in my early athletic articles. Uh, I just don't know how Minnesota is going to handle it. I mean, uh, you can take them. Um, you just have to be prepared that they keep them in that HLR role. That's that's the only downside to any of this. It's just how the team uses them because he is their best reliever. 
and I'm sorry, and Baldelli is also a disciple of Tampa Bay. So he has the same mentality where Tampa's coming from. So he's done this before. He knows the whole situation. Um, I, I, in TJFBR, I actually drafted Duran, and I didn't go after Lopez because I don't want two in the same situation. I'd rather have just the better pitcher overall because the better pitcher will either get the higher leverage and or the saves, and that's what I want. And, and you're saying in that, then you have Helsley and Duran. That's fantastic. Then you just take a couple of late darts, and, and you can add saves in season. I mean, that's that's that, that's, that's, that's that was exactly what I did, which is why mm -hmm. I took Gallegos because Gallegos was, good, was a good handoff. And you take and you take. I took some darts later on also, and, and just in case they hit, I don't need to surf the the fab wire to get closers later in the season. Hopefully, yeah. No, that's a great point. That Duran as the number one probably doesn't work for you, but as the number two, it probably works very well. Yes. Oh, yeah. As a, as a second reliever with upside, he's fantastic. Yes. Right. You know, question. You know, you mentioned uh, you know being on the pulse for the the guy a week before he actually gets the save. How would we spot Griffin Jacks? Like, just to take him for example, because he came up here in Minnesota situation. How do we spot that he's the guy a week before? How does that work? If if he's pitching in high leverage situations and Lopez is floundering. And the team is not saying that Duran's going to be our guy. Then you can just take that speculative dart. You hold on to him for a week, and then if they don't elevate him, you can move on. But you're doing it at like a two dollar bid, as opposed to you wait the extra week to see what happens. Okay, he gets a save on Monday, so now the week after he's going to be going for seventy five dollar bids. That that's what I'm that's what I'm saying. You're trying to avoid is no, no, totally, totally understand. My question to you though is. Um, you know, as you know, advice to our listeners here. What are we? What are we looking for? Are we looking for leverage index on fan graphs? Are we? Are we? Yeah. Yep. I, I use the WPA. I use the leverage index, and I look at the the innings on Baseball Reference and the game logs that they're being used. So if they're, you know, again, if they're not in the ninth, but they're in those high leverage situations before it gets to Duran, it's possible that he will leapfrog just because they want to keep Duran in that role. And a follow a follow up question to that is with the change of the rules with no shift, is it more worthwhile to get a reliever that's more prone to get a strikeout and and they'll put they'll, they'll put the more um, K uh, per, higher K per nine uh, pitchers in the ninth inning or in the save situation just because there's a better chance of them striking them out as opposed to having to hope there's a ground ball hit into the shift. It should, and we'll you know hopefully we can figure that out in the first month if teams are changing their how they're structuring that late end situation. Um, and, and that's that's something that helps Munoz because he's on a very, very team friendly contract and he's 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 their best strikeout arm. So if Seattle decides that they don't want balls in play in the ninth inning and they're gonna go to him more, that's just a situation where they they could start to elevate him as the season progresses into more safe situations. Um, and, and and again, like I said, if you look at his contract, it's criminal. I mean, talking about the Seattle situation with Sewell Munoz, both of those are going for actually very costly in, in drafts. Is either of them working it, it working in terms of the price? Because I mean, you're getting, what, half the saves and you're still paying a full closer price, right? Yeah, it's, it's the same idea. It's, it, you're taking them as a second closer, not your first. Either one of them as a second closer is okay. If you need strikeouts, you're taking Munoz. If you're looking for more saves, you're taking Seawald. Okay. Kansas City uh, is... Barlow the guy, or does Orotis Chapman stand the chance? Uh, new situation, new manager, so who the heck knows, but what's your best guess? Um, I have I was off of Chapman last year, so I, I don't think he's going to suddenly become what he used to be this year. Um, I, I still think Barlow's the guy, but I think they're going to share more than people want, want to happen. Barlow was a top 10 reliever last year. Mm -hmm. 24 saves, he was worth more than what people paid for him, is that going to repeat? Is he a good value this year? Uh, now, see, Barlow is more likely to be traded than Bednar just because of the arbitration, and you already, you've already you seen that you know Kansas City is going to turn over the roster during this rebuild. I, I This is the last chance they have to trade Barlow in his arbitration thing. I, I, just, I have a hard time believing that they're not going to move him this summer. And if you saw the way, and if you saw the way uh, Chapman pitched last year, you don't want anything to do with him. I mean, he was really, <laughs> really bad last year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, no, good, great advice on the Kansas City versus Pittsburgh. Very eye-opening. 
All right, let's talk about a bunch of situations where uh, just absolutely uncertain for many reasons. Uh, and maybe the advice that you have, Greg, is don't, don't buy anybody, uh, you know, unless unless somebody, uh, you know, puts a gun to your face and says you got to buy somebody where you're in <laughs> a very deep mono league. But let's start with uh, let's start with Detroit. Actually, I kind of like this situation because it looks like there's nobody there but Lang. Lang has shown really good strikeout rate. Walks are a little bit of a problem mm-hmm. for him, but that that was Gregory Soto the last couple of years, and he seemed to get a lot of saves. So is Lang the guy? Is this an uncertain situation, or are you fully confident and pay for Lang? Because he's, he's pretty cheap. He's going actually really cheap in drafts. Yeah, he had like a surge, but now he's settled back in at a more palatable uh, price point. I'm okay with Lang. Um, it's just uh, what's going what's Detroit going to do as their season progresses as well. And I, I do like that Hinch has kind of protected him instead of putting pressure on Lang because he, I think he's only 27. Instead of coming out and saying Lang's my guy, you know, he's doing the whole thing where he's making him earn it. But he's got the best swing and miss stuff in there. I mean, yeah, they could give a few early saves to Jose Cenero just because he's an expiring free agent at the end of the season that they want to try and build any trade value. But you're not going to get much for Cisnero anyway. So uh, I'm okay with Lang. Again, same deal. Just like Diaz, just... If you get Lang, just plan on strikeouts, a little bit higher whip, and um, probably 20 saves. If you get more than 20, then it's gravy. And as your second closer or your third closer. Correct, yeah, second or third. Yeah, no, it can't be your primary, yeah. (laughs) Ruvain, let's go to you first in Chicago White Sox. And uh, Liam Hendricks, uh, why don't you update on his health situation and – you know what? Tell you know everyone what he has and how it will affect him, how he pitches, and uh, when do you think he'll come to return? And maybe will he be the guy upon return? Well, I think he'll be the guy when he comes back. But the question is when he's going to come back because he is battling cancer, and that is a big deal. And then that zaps your ability to have stability or and and stamina throughout the entire course of the season so they even when he comes back they may ease him back in so i you know you can't really draft him at this point you may be able to pick him up later if you hear news that he's starting to ramp up or he's starting to get going or he's getting better i mean, it's it's possible that he could be he could close toward the end of the season but i think graveman is the guy because he has history of closing he closed with the a's in the past um, Ronaldo Lopez, though, is very, very interesting because he has the ability, he has closer stuff, and he may overtake Graveman before the season's over. I just picked Graveman in TGFBI in, like, the 25th round. I thought that was a pretty good price for a, hey, you know, get some clo- get some saves in the beginning of the year, dart. Uh, what's your take in the bullpen? Uh, is it Graveman or Lopez? Do you Should you roster any of them, uh, Greg? Uh, I'm Team Lopez. But that's because Graveman's inflated whip in the second half last year. It was, I believe, almost 1.5. I'm just nervous. Um, Graveman did get some saves when he was with Seattle. Um, I just don't know that he's the best reliever in that bullpen. I, I agree with Ruvain that Lopez has the best stuff for being a closer, and he had a 0.81 whip. Um, if, his, if his slider is acting more like a slider and less like a cutter, Um, That will give him a little bit better strikeout potential. So I would rather take a chance with him. And in a mono league, it can't hurt having Bummer, as you alluded to earlier. As long as he's healthy, you know, he could be a very sneaky. He'll just get you like five saves, but um, he'll get you strikeouts and some other things too, uh, the deeper the format. Yeah, so I picked him at something like around 375, Graveman. I mean, I wasn't even expecting to get him, but... Three, pick three seventy five. Lopez was gone way before. All right, I'll take I'll take a shot on somebody. You know, mm-hmm. um, Carlos Estevez in the uh, Los Angeles of Angels. Uh, no, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Is that what they're called? Um, yeah, it, it, I mean, he was brought in. Seems to be the most likely guy. We haven't heard anything exactly, or have we? Uh, what's your take on that bullpen situation? Well, they said he would have to earn it. I mean, they kind of gave him that, you know, he's being paid to be a high leverage pitcher. Um, But then his first two outings were just horrible in spring. So we don't know if he was overthrowing. Nevin said he was, he was trying to work up in the strike zone. They were trying to get him to throw his four seam fastball higher. I mean, we don't know how these things go. You know, sometimes pitchers working on a pitch and if he doesn't have the feel for it, it just goes sideways fast. Um, I, I think he will open the year as the primary save share, 
Um, but if he's struggling early on, um, I think you'll you, we could see Ben Joyce get up sooner rather than later. I just have to tell everyone to temper their expectations because Joyce only appeared once on back-to-back days last year. Uh, he did it with Tennessee. He did not do it when he was at Double A. Now Double A was only a 13 13 game sample, but we just have to see if he's durable enough to handle um, back to back situations, you know, because that's required if you're going to be a closer on a team. So it's okay to start with Estevez. Um, those in dynasty leagues, though, if if Joyce is somehow still available, you probably want to stash him for for down the road. Worth the cost, Ruben. No, I think this whole situation is a situation you stay away from. Estevez has not pitched well in the spring. And talking about another closer situation in Arizona, Mark Melanson has looked even worse oh. in spring. He's <laughs> He's been so bad. And that's another situation where, you know what, sometimes you're better off just going with a middle reliever, a better middle reliever on a better team than to blow up your ERA and whip and have a, and have a quote-unquote closer on one of these teams. Yeah, I I think I got a phone call from the Diamondbacks needing a pitcher. I don't know what that what was about. Uh, but <laughs> Mantiply, Chafin, Ginkle, Melanson, I, I I feel like, I mean, I'm sure the team knows what they're doing, but <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, I really don't, and I'm trying to follow the situation. I can't even give you my best pick. Like it's such a and it's such a bad situation as it is. Not a fantastic team. No certainty of anything. Um, uh, uh, Frank Stamfel uh, in uh, NL Labor took three out of the four for ch- all cheap, but he's like, "Well, I got three out of four. What the hell?" Uh, he took three and, from those four. Yeah, three out of the four. No, um, I meant so, three from the four you listed because yeah. I would, I would, if I'm taking a late dart, I'm throwing it on Castro or Miguel. Okay. Yeah. The guys yeah. you listed, I'm not even, I'm not even really? thinking about. Yeah, Miguel really? Castro. He, he, he has, he has that 97 mile an hour fastball. He can close. The other guys, uh, they're, they, they're shaky when they're in that role. While Castro has pitched for both New York teams, so he can pitch under pressure. So I think he may actually be a better fit. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking working with Strom. I mean, if we, if we remember, Ryan Presley got to Houston as a guy with, with strikeout stuff, but his command wasn't always there. And Strom tailored, he tweaked his arsenal and he turned Presley's career around. And, you know, if, if you're hoping that happens, then then if that does take with Castro and he has shown better command this spring, I'm not going to go results, but he's, he's throwing strikes and that's going to be a key for his success. So that's why I'm saying Castro or Miguel. I just, you know, Miguel saved... 30-something games in the NPB last year, so he's trying to take the Robert Suarez path to relevance in the, in the majors. You would stay away from all these guys, though, right? In, in most, in, in yes. Mix, I mean, mix, yeah. Mixed or shower, right? Mix 15. Yeah, in a mix, mixed, you know, in a 12 team, I'm not going in yeah. there. In a 15, I'll take a dart on one of the two I said, but, okay. you know, if they're not doing it early, I'll just drop them and move on. Got it. All right. What about Oakland, another uh, another team that's not going to win a lot of games. Uh, Trevor May, former Met. Uh, adios, I guess. Uh, you got Danny Jimenez, Jackson, Acevedo. Um, I mean, May got paid, so mm-hmm. do they give it to him because he's already paid for it? What, what, what? What's your take? Yeah, I mean, Trevor May is the highest paid guy in Oakland. Is that right? Oh, yes. Yeah. He's, and he's, what, he's getting $7 million? It's, it's like not even close, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. I think their 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 payroll tripled when he when they signed them. It didn't make any sense. I mean, why are they signing a seven million dollar quote unquote yeah, closer they do when they need everything else? I, I think they just wanted a a veteran in the bullpen. You know, the Cubs did that the last couple of years. They they went out and got a couple of veterans to help the young guys understand how to handle those leverage situations. Uh, I think best case scenario is he gets like twelve saves and then they flip him at the trade deadline. Got it. It's it's yes. a flip situation. That's and it. also, Trevor May is from the West Coast. He is from yep. Seattle, so he's, that's why he went there. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, uh, the nicest thing about Trevor May is that right after the Mets won every game, he would be tweeting, let's go Mets. So just to get if you follow him on Twitter, um, then get ready for a let's go A's, I guess, every time they win. So there you go. Uh, Miami, uh, another situation. They brought in uh, Matt Barnes. They got Floro. They got Scott. They traded for AJ Puck. 
Um, Puck will presumably not start. He will be in the bullpen. Does that mean they traded for their closer? Or are they going to go with Floro, who has closed? Well, Matt Barnes has definitely done it, but he walks the farm. Uh, what are they doing in Miami? Uh, Schumacher said that they're going to start with a matchup-based approach, but if I'm going for skills, I'll take a late dart on Puck and see what happens. They do have Scott that can pitch to lefties, and and Scott's probably better served just facing lefty parts of the lineup, not being uh, – he was just used over you – know, overused last year. It, it set him up for failure. Um, he struggles with command. Uh, he got 20 saves but with a 1-6 whip. Uh, so I, I would take a chance with Puck, hope he stays healthy, and hope that he throws his slider more because if he does, he can get more strikeouts. But we need him to do those things. Uh, hopefully, Stottlemyre will get him to do that. The only caveat with that, though, is that Dylan Flora has been the number two guy to close for the last couple of years, and the Marlins continue to seem to use him in the closer role. New so manager. At least there is, yeah, it, it's, I think it has to do with that, but now there's a new manager there. So, you know, everything changes a little bit. I like Puck, but when he, I don't think the A's ever used him as closer just because he was a lefty. They, they used um, Danny um, Jimenez when, when, he was, when Puck was there. Um, Puck breaks down a lot, though. That's the problem. He has to stay healthy. If he can stay healthy, then he can close. But otherwise, if you want the safer one, the guy who stays healthy, that's Dylan Floro. But Floro missed most of last year. Besides last year, but Puck. Puck's I mean, I, I, I don't think I don't think there's any safe option in the Miami bullpen. I just said if I'm throwing a late dart, I'm putting it on Duck. I'll, I'm just uh, Puck. I'm putting it on the skills guy. I'm not. Yeah, you could be right, Ruvain. Floro can end up leading the team in, in saves and. You know that's okay. Uh, you know it's it's just pick your poison in these in these sorts of bullpens. Unfortunately, yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm going with the duck approach, and I'm just going to duck the situation. And... <laughs> <Atta> boy. <laughs> Let's go with that. Uh, but here's the situation I, I don't think you should duck. Uh, Philadelphia, who were the are the reigning National League champions, and they signed a pretty good guy, might I say, Hall of Famer, and Craig Kimbrell. Uh, they've got Dominguez. They traded. And they didn't have to, but they traded for Gregory Soto. They also have Alvarado, who has shown some good stuff. Um, any one of them could be the closer, to be honest with you. Uh, what will they do in Philadelphia? I don't really have a good read on this. Greg? Well, Rob Thompson said that they're going to use a quotation marks floating closer, which means it's matchup-based approach. He was comfortable doing it when he took over for Girardi, and I don't I, – Unless injury happens or somebody just comes out and is dominant, even Thompson said, unless somebody just distances himself from the pack, that it'll be shared situations through the season. So, you know, you can take somebody and hope they get 15 saves, but that might be the cap. Unless, you know, Kimbrell's ties to Dombrowski, give him a shot at it. I, I just, you know, same deal. If I'm going skills, it's, Alv- it's, uh, it's Dominguez or Alvarado. Uh, but I, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get many Phillies on my teams. So is it worth taking uh, like an Alex Lang from Detroit rather than getting uh, you know Kimbrel? I mean you have to pay more for 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 Lang this year, but you know it, I do. It, but but he's younger and has more strikeout upside. I would just I, I'd rather get and hope for twenty saves from Lang than whatever I'm gonna get from Kimbrel. Right, and and you'd still get you'd still take Duran of Minnesota over any of these guys, right? Mm-hmm. Now the the Philly situation for me is a little bit odd because Kimbrel, wherever he's gone, he's only closed. When he tried to pitch the eighth inning, he was not that good at it, which makes me think that they're going to try to have him pitch the ninth. And last year, toward um, the end of the season, um, Rob Thompson was using Sir Anthony Dominguez in all the high leverage situations, mm-hmm. not necessarily to close, but the high leverage, which means he felt that he was the best guy in the bullpen. I still think he is the best guy, and he happens to be another guy that I drafted in my TGFBI team because so I know he's not going to get a full amount of saves, but having those three guys, having Helsley, Duran with half a save, with more than half a save, and having and having a Sorrentino Dominguez, you're not you're not blowing the budget out, and at the same time, you're getting good quality or middle relievers if you're not getting the saves. Yeah, I tend to, to give Kimbrell an extra buck or so because of that. I mean, we're not talking about just any person. I mean, he's floating around. Hey, I'm Craig Kimbrell, and I've had all these saves. And, oh, you want me to come here and b- take a, sh- a save share on a National League pennant winning team? That sounds great. I mean, he probably could have gone anywhere and been the closer. I, I would assume that's what he would want to do. Or maybe he just wants the bigger money. I don't know. But uh, I, 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 will, I will give him the, the nod for more likely to get saves. 
Um, if my my guy, cons- no. excuse me, if I can just interject, my concern here is the Dodgers are one of the best teams at taking a pitcher and making them better, and they couldn't make Kimbrel better. Interesting. Yeah, that's Interesting. that's true. That's true. And the Phillies have have the opposite. They make the pitcher worse, especially when it comes to the bullpen. <laughs> That's just the way it's been. <laughs> all right. Just a couple of situations left. And thanks for going all the way around the league with us. I think this is very helpful to our listeners. Uh, Chicago Cubs. Uh, you got Hughes. They imported Fulmer. There's also Boxberger, who certainly has experience. You got Albert Azulay, who has some good stuff. Uh, new manager, wide open. But uh, the Hughes. No. He's the only lefty. Um, I... If I'm if, Fulmer, yeah, same, yeah, same deal. If I'm throwing a late dart, it's on Michael Fulmer. He's 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 tweaked his arsenal. He's one of these guys that's adding the sweeper. Um, you know, I think we feel like Fulmer's old, but he's really not, and he's on a one year deal. I think he's like their Robertson this year, where they'll they'll use him as a primary save share, and if they're contending, they'll keep him, and if they're not in contention, they'll flip him to a contender and move on to the next guy. And the Mets could have had him, but they traded him for Yoenis Cespedes. But that worked out. That did work out. They did get him to the World Series. You can't, you can't mm-hmm. knock that. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be disappointed about that. Nope, nope. And now Cespedes is on Cuba facing Matt Harvey uh, against Italy. So there you go. Uh, all right, uh, last situation, and I, we really talked about this one already, the Dodgers. Um, I mean, any of these guys. I, I've taken Phillips in two leagues already because I like his stuff, and even if he's not the guy, he still gets some percentage of save share, and he's a good pitcher. Um, Hudson, starting the, I don't like taking guys, especially on on you know in the NFBC style where there's no IL. I don't like taking guys who are on the IL. Like, I just don't like doing it. It's it, You're wasting a very precious spot. So I haven't been taking Hudson or, or so. Uh, I don't know. Who, who, what are your takes? Do you like Gratterall, Phillips? So how would you buy the uh, this, this situation? Which, by the way, Dodgers, they're not as good as they were last year, I don't think. But they should still be good and should offer, especially the pitcher's park, a lot of save opportunities. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're taking Phillips as a, a second or third reliever on your team for the ratios and – uh, 10 saves, then he's fantastic. I think, I think they'll try Hudson early, and if he if he's not doing well, uh, when Reyes comes back, they're going to try him. I think it's just going to be a churn. Uh, that's what makes me nervous. So if you want to get one of those guys, you can. But I, as you were intimating, I prefer having any of them in a the league where there is an IL spot, not necessarily chewing up a a spot on my. If I have a seven person bench, I don't want one of them sitting there. All right, before we do the Ruvain's injury update, which I'm sure there's a lot of injuries, um, any final thoughts? Because we really went through every single situation, and hopefully the listener got a good idea of what to do, not to do, um, our our thoughts on the closers themselves, Greg, Greg's thoughts for the most part, of course, because Greg, do, and by the way, I just want to recommend uh, Reliever Recon. Uh, Greg, you do a fantastic job. And, you know, I was mentioning earlier, you know, how do you know uh, to get Griffin Jacks and all that? Uh, I mean, that, that's what your site sort of does, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, it, you know, it's 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 five dollars a month but it's basically if you go to dunkin donuts that's a sandwich and a coffee so it's not that expensive for uh, i i I mean i put out at least usually one one post a day Um, i update the closer charts in real time i'm tracking spring training strike percentages swing strike rates when Statcast is available anyways it's just uh, we have a podcast that's once a week from nate and aaron um, if you play in a head-to-head league, our, our bullpen guru, he puts out post on the what he calls a fruit, which is the first reliever out of the pen to vulture those uh, wins. So like teams where a starter might only go four innings, he identifies the guy that's going to come in after that might swoop in and grab those wins. Those are hugely important head-to-head formats. Um, and, uh, you know, we get work every now and again from Eric, but it's just we focus on relievers and uh, we try and do all the dirty work for you. So when it comes down to, to your uh, free agent decisions, you, you should have a real firm idea uh, of, of who you're targeting and what you're going to do. It's, you know, I, I put a lot of work into this uh, and, and it bears itself out in the uh, closer charts and all the information that we put forth. And again, that's why last year people who subscribed to Recon were getting Daniel Bard and Ryan Helsley uh, before before the rest of their league mates. Yep, totally agree, and I do recommend it. I am a subscriber myself. 
Any final thoughts, Ruvain? Otherwise, it's your injury report. I'll go straight into the injury report because I actually have some darts, possible darts in the injury report. I'll start with TJ Antone, the guy who used to close for the Reds. He had Tommy John surgery in 2021, and he was slowed in his offseason throwing program because of a right forearm injury. Um, he made an announcement on his Instagram account that he had a PRP injection for his flexor strain in, in, a, in his right elbow, and it should keep him out for half a year. So don't roster him just yet. Another guy you may want to keep on your radar, former Nationals closer, Sean Doolittle. Sean Doolittle is not supposed to be ready for opening day because he did have surgery on his on his UCL. He had an internal brace procedure similar to what um, Bryce Harper had, similar to what um, um, Reese Hoskins had, and he's not going to be ready for opening day, so it did slow down his rehab uh, uh, process, but he's somebody, if, if Kyle Finnegan can't hold that job, he may slide into that closer role because they like him there in Washington. Another guy you may want to have just on your radar – Trevor Rosenthal for the Tigers. They signed him late. He had a lat injury last year. He said he's 100%, but because he signed so late, manager AJ Hinch said he's not going to be ready for when opening day starts. But he's a guy just to have on your radar. Keep watch and see how, how Lang does, just in case you want to take that dart on Rosenthal. We mentioned Daniel Hudson. He still he had ACL surgery last year. Um, he was scheduled to face live hitters this week. He will probably not be ready for opening day. Look for a mid-April return for him. All right. A lot of great stuff here. Um, Greg, what else you got going other than uh, Reliever Recon? I know you do stuff at The Athletic. I uh, want to just tell everybody uh, where they can uh, read you, follow your work, and everything. Uh, all things Greg Jewett. <laughs> well, well, again, first, thank you for the kind words about Recon and the work. I, I greatly appreciate it. And you're you're uh, obviously one of the best competitors in our in our tout league. And I respect all the work that you and Ravain do with this great show. And, you know, it's just awesome. So, Anywho, uh, I will have, you know, The Athletic asked me to do an article the other day on um, seven relievers past pick 100. I use Fantasy Pros ADP just so it's, you know, I don't want to, sometimes I feel like I'm too NFBC centric, so I have to expand my horizons. Um, that I also, when I get done recording this, I have to go downstairs and do a um, closers ranking for them that's due um, to be published. So that'll be, I'll probably be up to about two, three in the morning. And then go teach, but it's okay. I get used to it. Uh, so, in season, my ath- the athletic article runs on Tuesdays. I cover you know saves. I also have sold tiered rankings as a part of my thing, so because I know more leagues are shifting to solds as tr- as opposed to traditional saves. Um, and and the reliever recon stuff that uh, keeps me very busy, but also keeps me young. And uh, it allows me to uh, keep growing with my uh, my passion for fantasy baseball. So uh, I appreciate you guys having me on, and uh, hopefully it'll expose a couple of new people to our site. Of course. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be on our show. Um, yeah, I, I had a good time with you here, and uh, I think— of course. Some really, really, really great stuff. Um, and uh, if you're playing me the playoffs this year in Tatworth, please take a dive. Thanks. <laughs> I took a dive the year before when I had Chapman active. That's why I got off him so oh. fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm go. kidding. I, I would never I know, ask, I know, I know. I would I never know, ask I know somebody. You no, I hope no. you're a fierce competitor, but I, I enjoy it. it. It makes me get it makes me better, so it's all good. I might hand you money, but I'm not gonna, you know, ask you just just that, you know. I'm a, gen- <laughs> I'm a gentleman about it. All right. Just kidding, just kidding. All right, Ruth, what about you? You can follow me on Twitter at MLB Injury Guru, where I tweet out injury updates as they come. Next man up. I also have an in-season article, which will start the first week of the season, discussing all these injuries on Rotoballer. And also, I believe our next podcast, we will be t- discussing injuries, just injuries, I believe. Isn't that correct, Ariel? Uh, yeah, it's going to be the Ruvain special here, uh, where we'll just let Ruvain go. Uh, I'll I'll chime in and ask some pointed questions, but yeah, Ruvain will put together all the injuries you should know about. Uh, we'll get that out for you. So looking forward to that. Um, yeah, and again, I want to apologize about my hoarse voice. You know, I had to determine, I had to decide: is this above the acceptable level of you listen to the to, to him anyways, uh, or should we just scrap this podcast? I think it was above the level of all right, not the greatest voice, but uh, we'll hear it. Do, do you guys agree? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and I think the, the throat exercises you did before the show actually really, really helped. <laughs> yeah, Ru- Ruby and I should have been should have been taping those and putting them on Twitter. 
Uh, that, that was a that was a mistake. I, I should have had that. That that could have been gold. like collateral when you wanted me to take a dive and tout. It was gold. It was gold. <laughs> All right. I won't do that for you guys, but uh, that was from some fun stuff. My voice was a lot worse before then, but uh, yeah. All right. That's it. I'm Ariel Cohen, uh, ATCNY on Twitter, Fangraphs, Rotoballer. Check out my stuff. Beat the Shift podcast each and every week. Uh, and we'll do, we'll do uh, one more, uh, one or two more, I should say, preseason podcasts to get you ready for the season. All right, good luck drafting, everybody. Once again, thank you so much to Greg Jewett for coming on and going through the entire universe of closers with everybody. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Beat the Shift podcast presented by Fangress. Follow us on Twitter at beat underscore shift underscore pod.